Yeah. Um, also, the whole idea that our control group is already weaker and our testing groups are already stronger, had we done this on our control group, we might have had very different results because they were more untrained to begin with. So this idea that these people are decently strong already aren't seeing a change, but if we had weaker people to begin with, maybe... We would have seen a bigger change if we got them stronger. Yeah, or right. Yeah, might have had a bigger effect size. Maybe less spread, who knows, yeah. right? Because they were, they were very different at the beginning of the study. Uh, one of the things that I thought interesting about some of the different tests that they did is if you look at the control group and the, the squat jump and the counter movement jump, um, from pre-test to post-test, they had a little bit of an increase, but then if you look at the, the drop jump, they had a slight decrease for the most part from pre-test to post-test. but the drop jump is probably less of a learning effect whenever you do it the first first couple of times through your testing, right? Whenever you familiarize them. But whenever you do it, if anybody's ever tested um, counter movement jump or squat jump, that there is a bit of a learning effect with that. And even though they, they didn't train, they still had a little bit of an effect from having learned the movement. So whenever they did it post-test, they have a little bit of an improvement just because they're continuing to do that. And then you see that probably also with their squat and leg press numbers too, that They've done it before, even though they don't train for eight weeks. They know the movement a little bit more, so there's a bit of a learning effect there. So there was a bit of a learning effect, but even in spite of that, there wasn't an improvement. There right, was. But that's why you can see like some improvements from post-test to, or pre-test to post-test, even though they sat on their ass a lot of time. Right. They, they, they were still sore from the pre-test. <laughs> eight weeks before, right? Okay, Brett, stand up. Why did they use the death jump at all? I, did, they, did they discuss why? They, they said that they used it as a measure of speed strength performance. So they wanted, they wanted different assays for speed strength performance. And this is one that's been published previously. And they, had, they were able to derive this reactive strength index. And they thought it was cool. So they did it. All right. okay. I don't remember a more detailed rationale for that in the paper. Maybe it's in there and I forgot it. But I don't remember a more detailed rationale for that. Anybody, did anybody recall any more elaborate explanation for why they chose the drop jump? They thought it was a good test of power. You know, it, basically your ability to drop off the box and jump as high as possible with a minimum contact time. So the way they derived it, they're going to tell us in the method section, the way they derived this performance index, right, depended on how high they were able to jump after contacting and the size uh, or the uh, the time in contact with the floor before they jumped, right? So the higher you jump and the less time of contact after the jump, or before the jump rather, the, um, the greater the performance index, right? So it's basically your ability to jump off of a box and bounce up as high as possible. So what do we have here? Correlations between maximal strength parameters and speed strength parameters. Perhaps our resident statistician would like to <laughs> mathematician totally would like would like to interpret this data for us. Diego, will you stand up and tell us what's going on here? All right. So um, they looked at um, I'm assuming this is correlations between. I guess it doesn't say if it's pre or post test. So the rows are one rep max for squat and leg press, but I don't see if it's pre or post intervention. Let's assume it's post. Uh, and the columns are going to be the results for each one of the tests that they performed, the different uh, depth for the jumps and the counter movement of the squat jump. And what these numbers are, they're going to range between minus one and one. And they are going to say, intuitively, how closely one parameter changes as a result of the other one changing. So if the squat jump, I'm sorry, if the one rep max, if improving, or if a higher one rep max in the squat was uh, incredibly um, predictive of an improvement in the squat jump height, then that number will be 
positive and close to 1. And if it was incredibly predictive of a decrease in squat jump height, it would be large in absolute value and negative. Uh, and if they don't have anything to do with each other, they would be close to 0. Uh, so and so, so true or false? True or false? If the number for the squat jump for the, for the squat group is higher than for the leg press group, the squat caused more, yeah, you, you didn't even have to think about that, right? So what does this tell us about causation? Nothing, Nothing right? What is it telling us? They're telling you right up here. They're yeah. telling us about the correlation between these two things, right? Go ahead. Thank you, Diego. Is that the whole group, or is that just, that doesn't indicate who that is, or is that the no. The one, so it's based, yeah, it's telling us for the training groups, right, what was the correlation, actually for the whole thing, right, it's telling us what the correlation is between one rep max squat performance on the post-test and one of these power performance measures on the post-test. And it's telling us how highly correlated they were. We talked about this a little bit last year, okay? So it's telling us whether there's a positive correlation and how strong it is, whether there's no correlation, or whether, the, just like Diego said, or a negative correlation, and how strong the negative correlation is. It's telling us how well correlated these two things are. It's not telling us about causation. So let's say, let me, let me put it in, let's say that I want to, I want to, um, See if there's a correlation between the temperature and how many patients come into the ER. There is, right? But let's say that I want to demonstrate that. So each day, I plot the number of patients who come into the ER and the temperature, the maximum temperature outside, right? And I get a plot of points, right, in a two-dimensional space, and I find the line that best fits those points. Now, if it's a completely ran, if there is no correlation, then there, there will be no best fit line. The slope will be, basically, there will be no correlation. But if there's a positive correlation, the hotter it gets, the more patients come into the ER, then there will be some line with a non-zero, non-negative slope that will tell me what the strength of that correlation is. Does that make sense? What it will not tell me is that the heat makes people come to the ER, right? Similarly, if I have a correlation coefficient, and this is a fairly strong correlation coefficient, right, that tells me the correlation is point, basically 0.7 between the squat and, one, and, and the squat jump, squat one rep, one rep max strength and the squat jump, it tells me that there's a strong correlation. It does not say that the squat made the squat jump stronger. Is that fair? Right. So it tells us about correlation, not about the underlying mechanism. Make sense? Okay. Why aren't the, the second row in table five, is that the performance index for the 32 inch, 30, why aren't they negative? Is that just absolute yeah. number of percent difference? These are the, it's, a co, it's the correlation coefficient, right? right. right? So but basically what it's saying is that for that, it's this, right? There's, there was a negative, a, a weak negative correlation between this value and that value. That's all it's saying. And we sort of saw that in the raw data before, right? So the people in the leg press group got their performance index decreased. But why, don't, why isn't there a negative number for the next three to the right, for the 32, the 40, and the 48, right? So if we're at negative 0.1, why aren't they all below zero? Mm -hmm. They're all basically at zero. Yeah. yeah. There's, they're basically telling us they're basically telling us that there was no, and because the negative number 
right. because the spread was so large. Independent. That table is independent of all the tests things. that were done in, Those in the study. That's the improvement. Yes, I, I understand, but, uh, but should we be surprised that there's no correlation between those variables given the data that we saw? No. I mean, that's why I'm saying. Although it is somewhat interesting that there is a significant correlation to the squat jump and the counter movement jump and virtually no correlation whatsoever with the drop jump, right? Yes, it is. It is interesting. Could you, uh, you can't really say this, but it makes you question the drop drums validity as a speed strength kind of test. No, it doesn't make me question the validity of the test. It makes me question the effect of the squat and the leg press on that particular performance parameter. Yes? One of the things that said in the introduction was that in previous research, the drop jump results were already contradictory. And that was one of the purposes, I think, of the experiment. And so in that case, I guess their hypothesis turned out as well. And they actually make some speculation and discussion of why there seemed to be a differential effect on the squat jump and the counter movement jump and the drop jump, right? And interestingly, in the discussion, one of the things that they point to is joint angles, which I thought was odd given what Hartman has previously had to say about joint angle specific training. So I don't know if we're even going to be able to get to that. Um, so that was kind of interesting. So now we can actually get to the introduction, <laughs> right? So you, can, so you start to see how this, how this works, right? So in the introduction, the authors tell us speed strength performance is a fundamental athletic attribute. I think I would agree with that. Again, I think what they're talking about here is power, right? And power is not only a fundamental athletic attribute. I think you can make an argument that it is the most fundamental athletic attribute. Um, present when the execution of a movement in a given time requires the development of large forces and high movement speeds. The literature suggests increases with strength training in some metrics of speed strength, the squat jump and the CMJ, they do say that the drop jump was less clear. I'm not sure that it was their purpose to, uh, to uh, impeach the drop jump as a performance measurement, um, but they do acknowledge up front, and probably because their data said what, they, what it said, that they wanted to, you know, we know that this is not quite as, quite as clear. The best way to train speed strength remains a pointed issue, no shit. Right, so in the literature, right? What's the best way to get people more powerful? That still seems to be a point of issue. And we hypothesize that the same training regimen using two different exercises induces different adaptations to speed strength performance. That is what we call the alternative hypothesis. We already talked about that. The null hypothesis would be this. Two different training regimens produce no difference in adaptations. Okay. Does the data you have seen so far actually test these hypotheses? So now you've finally gotten to the point where the authors more or less explicitly state what their hypothesis is, but you've already seen their data. Does the data address these hypotheses? Is there anybody here who thinks it does not? Yeah, I think it does. I think their data address the hypothesis, however imperfectly. It's always going to be imperfectly. So 78 students, 39 experimental subjects, 39 controls, pre-test and post-test, three days before and three days after the first and last training sessions, respectively. The parameters tested, we already know what they are. One rep max, isometric maximum strength, counter movement jump and squat jump height, drop jump performance by RSI, Right? An eight-week training period, two times a week, and thank God, it was IRB approved. Right? <laughs> so the subjects were 78 students, mostly track and field athletes with some resistance training experience, so they knew how to do the squat and the leg press, so the authors tell us. Right? They were divided into two groups and subgroups. How? They, did anybody see how they did it? They don't really tell us. Right? So did they flip a coin? That's OK. Just tell us. Did they use some sort of random number generator? That's OK. Just tell us. Did they have them draw cards? Whatever. Right? But just tell us. 
They don't tell us. In fact, the only thing that they tell us is this. Because the better trained participants did not want to refrain from strength training, there was a tendency for weaker subjects to be in the control group. Holy shit. That is a problem, right? And so we see exactly what we saw. The weaker subjects gravitated to the control group because they wanted to sit in the dorm and eat Cheetos and watch porn during the training session, right? Whereas the strong people wanted to keep training. That's a problem. I'm kind of astonished that, first of all, I'm astonished that they did it. And second, I'm astonished that they reported it. Because the only thing they, t yeah, did you guys see something I didn't see? I was also going to say that in that last paragraph of their, their methods and their subjects, it said all participants were allowed to continue their usual. Yes, yes, we're going to, we're, yeah, we're that, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Not exercising with lower extremities. Yes. Yeah, we were also allowed to continue their sport specific yeah. regular training. Some of them were track and field athletes, some of them were field hockey athletes. Right. So in other words, they were allowed to, they were allowed to keep doing all their shit, right? right? Yeah, uh, it, well, actually, they told them not to do lower body training. But does that include well, well, what about the standard? What? But would that include a deadlift or power Yeah, they don't tell us. Right. So they don't tell us. So now we start, to, we start to get into some difficulties. Uh, they tell us how they, how they did the training leg press, the same protocol uh, as the squat. The control was randomly how? How? The control was randomly divided into two subgroups, a squat control group and a leg press control group. The participants were allowed to continue their usual upper but not lower body training, continuing their sport. No sample size analysis provided. Is that a problem? I tend to think it's more of a problem when, as in the paper that we're about to discuss, it's more of a problem when you, when you conclude that there is no difference between two things. Right. So if you're reporting to me, it's like we, we sampled this population and we found no difference. We also didn't do a sample size analysis. We also didn't do a power analysis. There it's more problematic. But I always want to see a sample size analysis. Right? I always want to see a sample size analysis. Here they're reporting that there was a difference. Right. So it doesn't seem quite as critical, but to me, as far as I'm concerned, it's not really according to Hoyle. Yeah. Also, this paper's hypothesis is not that squatting or leg pressing improves these measures, but rather that the difference between improvements is different. Right. That there to what extent is the fact that the control group selection is messed up really matters to the latter conclusion? Since we don't really care too much about the control group. No, we We're don't. We're not saying that the squat improved. Kind of moment jump. We're saying it improved it better than but they sampled but they sampled an entire population sure. and then the population was divided according to who was stronger basically sure. and I, I don't think there's any way that that's not a problem you're what you're saying what you're saying let's, is let's say they had done the exact same study and they had no control group whatsoever right then they would that be a problem no actually i think the groups controlled go. for each other right exactly. yeah no so no the, 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 the fact that the control group was but it introduces, it introduces an element where you're looking at it and you're saying, God, what were they thinking? And it, and it, raises, it raises fundamental doubts about the, their methodology and their, and their approach. We, we have to get through. I'm sorry you guys did so great with this that, that we're going to run out of time. So um, I can't believe we had five papers. Yeah. So this was cool. All right. So. Uh, this is important. We talked about this earlier. We talked about this, um, this ICC, which is the uh, intra-class correlation coefficient, right? In most medical research, what you see is called a kappa, a kappa statistic. It's kind of the same thing. It's what it is, is I, I'm not familiar with the, with the gory details of it, but what it does is it tells you how much things agree with each other or how tight the groups are. And I'll show you a graphical representation of that in a second. So what they're telling us is that the squat group, squat group uh, had an ICC of 0.88 and the counter movement jump 
0.93. That's, these were the interclass correlation coefficients for these two performance measures. What does that mean? Here is an example of a sample with a high, of samples with a high ICC, right? So when you plot them out, what you see here, the measurements all tend to bunch together. The measurements all tend to bunch together, 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 right? So there's a high degree of correlation. When you take repeated measurements, they tend to be close together. That's what it's saying. For something like a kappa value, you have investigators who are, say, counting cells on a slide and you have two different investigators and they're both counting cells and they're counting the same samples and you want to, cal you want to calculate how much of these two, two guys agree with each other. It's kind of the same thing. So what they're telling us is, is this test is pretty reliable as opposed to something like this which has a low ICC where if you look at a single group the measurement is kind of all over the place. Does that make sense? So that addresses the, the legitimate concern that was raised earlier how tight are these tests? How, what, kind of, what kind of output do they give us? And the answer that the authors are giving us is it gives us a pretty tight output. Dynamic jump, they also reported a pretty high ICC for the, dyna for the dynamic jump. And they're basically telling us here what we already figured, right? How the squat jump and how the, the drop jump and how the um, the counter movement jump were performed. Pretty standard, except they were really into the whole hands on the hips thing, right? <laughs> they were really, they, yeah, so all of it was done with the hands on the hips. I was supposed to take that out, but I didn't want to. Uh, so um, the, uh, 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 the reactive strength index, what we were talking about earlier, it, just as we surmised, it was a derived value. The jump height in millimeters divided by the time in milliseconds times 100. That gives us this derived value that we saw in the data that was presented earlier. So now we know how they did that. And so far, not a whole lot of surprise there. The maximum isometric strength test. At first, I was kind of unkind. I said they chose this because everyone does it. Right? Everyone in the literature does it. Everyone measures isometric strength. But actually, if you read the paper, because we're running a little short on time, I'm not going to go into it too much. They actually did give us a pretty good rationale for why they measured the, the isometric strength in this paper. And they basically did it on a legwork machine um, and used a pretty standard approach to measuring isometric strength. This tells us how they tested one rep max strength, which again, if you read it in detail, is pretty standard. There was nothing here that really pissed me off, right? This was what pissed me off. They didn't show us, they didn't give us exemplars. They just described to us how the exercises were performed. They didn't give us any exemplars, right? They didn't show us how the squat was done. So they tell us that the squat was performed to parallel, so that the thigh was parallel with the floor. What does that mean, right? We all know. It's real typical of exercise science. Yeah, so I was a little bit disappointed in that. Uh, what, do, what do I have here that I want to cover? Uh, the training protocol, right? They, they did five sets of six to eight one rep max from weeks four to six, and they adjusted the weight so that uh, people could continue to do these these five sets of six to eight rep max. And then they tell us, this is the commonly used method to improve maximal strength and power in short-term interventions, to which I go, really? Is it the commonly used? It may be an exercise science, but is it the method you use to get your clients stronger? Anybody? No. The statistical analysis we could talk about all day, but I'm just going to leave you with this quote from Feinstein from 1974. The most important issues in biostatistics are not expressed with statistical procedures. The issues are inherently scientific rather than purely statistical and relate to the architectural design of the research, not the numbers with which the data are cited and interpreted. Right? So in other words, it's not so much about how you analyze the data it's about how you collect the data, and we've already looked at that, right? In any scientific paper, you, like me, are likely to encounter statistical methods that 
your mind cannot begin to encompass, right? So for example, uh, they tell us that the data was checked for normality using the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. <laughs> I have no freaking clue what that means, right? What they're trying to tell me is that the data is normally distributed. It's not skewed in one direction or another. Similarly, they tell me that they did two-factor ANOVA after sphericity testing. I know what the ANOVA is, right? It's what I go ask my statistician to do on my data after I've collected it, right? It's the analysis of variance. It's a post hoc test of statistical significance. Sphericity testing? I don't know what that means. Did they look at how spherical everyone's butt was? And <laughs> I don't know what that means, right? Basically, what, they, what they're telling you is, is that the data was sufficiently normal or, or distributed appropriately so that the ANOVA could be used to determine statistical significance, right? So we can spend all day on this, right? But again, the real issues with any exercise science paper, any science papers, are usually going to boil down to, did the way the study was designed and the data was collected actually address the research question? Right? And if it did, and, you're, and you look at the data, and there still seems to be a problem with the data, yes, then you can start to like look at the statistical analysis or run off to your statistician and see if everything's according to Hoyle, but 99% of the time, you're gonna find the real problems or the real strength of, stu of the study in the methodology, okay? All of these things, the analysis of variance, the t-test, these are forms of hypothesis or significance testing, and there's like a whole slew of them. There was a time when I actually sort of knew how to do them but that is long gone, thank God, right? So you, there are all kinds of these kinds of things and the, and the way your data is collected, the type of data, parametric data, non-parametric data, normally distributed data, all kinds of data, depending on how you collect it and what kind of data you have determines how you perform this significance testing and what kind of tests you're gonna use for it. They gave us effect size, though. They gave us the Cohen D effect size, which is a, 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 an, extreme, uh, an extremely good thing about this paper, right? And when you, when you look at the science literature and the literature about science, what we see is a steady move away from this post hoc statistical testing and bowing down before the p-values towards things like the effect size and the correlation coefficient to tell us what we really need to know. This is the way things are going, and it's about time. This just tells you how to, affect, how to calculate the effect size um, in case you need to do that this afternoon. Um, this is basically about when they tell us that the data were normally distributed, this is basically what they're telling us. Most data is not normally distributed, certainly not perfectly normally distributed, but before you can do any sort of significance or hypothesis testing on data, you need to know whether it's normally distribu distributed or whether it's skewed. And if it's skewed, there are different statistical tests that you're going to choose to look at the statistical significance of the results. So basically, this was the part where we were gonna, because we had still another hour, this is the part where we were gonna go back through and look at the data again in light of what we already saw. but I don't think we need to do that. In the discussion, the authors tell us that the main finding is that the squat increased performance and the squat jump, counter movement jump, and drop jump more effectively compared with the leg press in short-term training. Anybody? Do you think the authors can support this conclusion? I think they can, right? There are flaws with this paper, and some of them are not insignificant. But I do think that on the whole, their data supports, notice I use the word support, it does not demonstrate this conclusion, it does not prove this conclusion, but I think their data supports this conclusion. That the squat and pre performance and the squat jump, counter movement jump, the drop jump, eh, right? But certainly in these two, eh, compared with the leg press and short-term strength training. 
And then they, they do some, a little bit of hand waving. Surprisingly, the squat reached higher percentage increases in the mean isometric force, but you know, there I'm kind of like, I don't care. Although the statistical significance level between both training groups was missed, an interesting finding, is it really? Because the higher conformity and posture, particularly for the hip joint angle, isometric and dynamic leg press should have led to greater conformity and muscle recruitment pattern and hence higher growth rates. What? And, and Hartmann has previously published data directly attacking the whole idea of joint angle specific training. So the, he was the second author on this paper. He was not the first author. He was not the senior author. He was in there. I, can, I, am, I can't help but imagine that the guy just went, ah, really? Right? So the benefit of the squat exercise is assumed to lie, again, in the body position that corresponds closely to the squat jump and the counter movement jump. The position of the body with respect to all joint angles in squat exercise is more similar to those two jumping types than in the leg press. Eh. No You're killing me here. So what? They just found that the leg press didn't have one impact on it anyway. So yeah, if you read the discussion, I'm not going to dig it out right now, but there's, this, there's a point in the discussion where there's a paragraph where they say one thing, yeah. they skip a paragraph, and the next paragraph they say exactly the opposite thing. So that's what happens in the discussion, right? And to, that's why, for me, the discussion is mostly valuable of in, in terms of putting the data into context and telling me where the field is at and where we're going to go from here. There's a lot of hand-waving, and they make a lot of speculation about the underlying mechanism for the effect that they observe, including this joint angle stuff and also some neural recruitment stuff, right? Some, I'm sure you saw that in there, right? Again, entirely speculative because their data cannot possibly support those speculations because they didn't look at that stuff. Well, that would have helped if they include some photographs of the hand that you were talking about, too. They did not include exemplars. We, yeah, as we already pointed out, that's why it's important for you to show us exemplars of how the, this training was actually done, how these movements were actually performed. Even if they had, their experimental design had nothing there to show whether that statement is true or not. That's right. But it, would, it still would have been nice to see, right? Sure. So for example, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have shown it, but it might have contradicted it, right? So if they had shown us a squat, and they would shown us a leg press, and then they would shown us the angle for the squat jump or the drop jump, we could have said, dude, there's no way those angles were the same, right? So it, it might not have supported it, but it could have contradicted it, and they should have shown us that material. So here's what here's kind of what I came away with at the la you know, last minute, saying, what are the pros and cons here? The pros are that they have a clear and relevant hypothesis, or a clear, and we're actually not talking so much about hypotheses anymore. We're talking about the research question, the research problem, right? They have a clear and relevant research problem. The experimental approach to the problem appears to be generally sound. Does anybody have an issue with that? I think their experimental approach to the problem was pretty sound. They, there was the use of both classical null hypothesis statistical testing and effect sizes. I actually think that's okay, right? As long as you show us both. The presentation of the data was adequate, but it could be better. How could it be better? Anybody? Thank you, that's exactly right. This study was larger than most exercise science studies, but it wasn't so large that you couldn't show us what happened to each individual subject in the study, right? And you should have done that. The results are of interest and seem to have practical implications. Cons, the sample seems to have been unnecessarily heterogeneous. Agreed? The allocation of samples to experimental groups is unclear and potentially problematic to say the least. I think we hashed that out pretty thoroughly. No sample size power analysis. The study was not small by XI standards, but not so large as to prevent investigators from showing us individual subject data. Other problems that we hit on here? Anybody real quick? The, the, several slides back, when it, it was saying that it was because of the squat angles and the movements were similar, that would lend itself to someone thinking that putting a weight on a baseball bat would be the way to go, right? Instead mm -hmm. of, they got stronger, so they were able to jump better. That's, mm -hmm. So their conclusion was all faced that way too, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? They were saying that their, 
that the reason that they were able to jump better was because the angles in the squat right. were more similar. So that would lend itself to the whole functional fitness thing. Of taking a 150-pound baseball bat and to improve your swing, yeah, right, which is... They got stronger because squats are better at making you stronger. Yeah. And which Hartman's already published an article that completely contradicts that idea. Yeah, which, is, which has kind of made the whole thing kind of shocking to me. All right, so that's the Hartmann paper. We're calling it the Hartmann paper. It's really worth that all, right? And you guys did an extraordinary job with that. Before we break, real quick, I just want to show you as a comparison, first of all, the next paper, which you should definitely read on muscle gains in women after a short training protocol, right? They show us exemplars, and we might have a little bit of a problem with how the movements were performed, but they show us how the movements were performed, or at least give us a vague and fuzzy idea, right? They show it. This is what I wanted to show you. Look at what they did here in this paper, this next paper, which we're not going to talk about in any depth at all. I love this, right? So what they're doing is they're showing us what happened in each individual group. Instead of simply giving us a bar that goes to here and shows us what the mean was, right, with an error bar, right? Instead, they show us what happened to each individual member, each individual subject in the study. So that we can look and say, uh, outlier much, right? <laughs> so we can look at the data ourselves and, and, and say, well, you know, uh, maybe if you take out these two outliers to, in, and tell us how you dealt with the outliers, maybe that might be a little bit more impressive. But we can look at the data ourselves and see that, you know, there's a lot of spread. And so while the difference in means might seem impressive and might be statistically significant, when we actually look at what happened to each individual member of the study, we're not quite so impressed. All right? And that's kind of what I wish they had done in the first paper. That would have been far more impressive.